Well, I'm happy to be here today. It is beautiful weather, and I'm kind of coming back home, just so we can all tie things together. I'm not just your neighbor from Mississippi, but I used to spend summers here with my grandparents. My grandfather was actually on the planning commission of Little Rock, Arkansas in the late 70s, early 80s. So I used to spend a lot of summers over in Boyle Park, if y'all know where that is, back when it was a little different neighborhood than it is today. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm also happy to see the submarine sitting across here at Admiral Hayes Fleet. So I want to talk to you about where I come from, and I'm hoping that we all know we're pretty much, we all come from the same place pretty much. Mississippi and Arkansas aren't far apart. Y'all are ranked the 42nd most obese, we're ranked the 50th. So y'all should applaud me even more. If it weren't for me, y'all be 43. But we're hoping, and what, the reason I think what I have to say may be pertinent to you is because it seems that Arkansas has kind of tracked what Mississippi's doing. As we got more obese, so did Arkansas. And so I hope as we solve the problem, y'all will track in that too. So maybe y'all won't, won't catch up to us. Y'all just stay eight below us. And we have to do this as a team, all of us. Uh, in the entire United States, but especially the southern states with the highest obesity burden. We're the ones who are taking the brunt of it. I want to, Anna said something and she, she said it as part of her talk and I know she believes it, but I want to say it again because this is why I'm here, this is why I do what I do, this is why I have the passion. The CDC says this generation of children may not live to be as old as we're going to live to be. That's absolutely wrong. I don't know any other way to say it. We can't let that happen. We have the science, our science, if we use it, these children should all live to be 110. And we're going the other way. And I don't know why it's not so obvious to people that we're just messing up. So, and there are just little things we can do. And what I want to talk about are those little things. And because the reason I talk about little things is that's all I can do. We don't have a big budget in Hernando. My entire city budget, and, and when I say whole budget, I have to pick up trash, pay 35 firemen at three police stations, pay 35 poli or at fire stations, pay an ambulance crew, pay 35 full-time policemen, do water and sewer, parks department. I do all that for $13.2 million a year. So y'all can see that I don't have any extra money. We don't have money for extra programming. So everything we do, we have to be creative. And I can see that there's been a lot of money spent. I can see the, the running trails here. I've seen the big damn bridge. I can see this pedestrian bridge. There's been a lot of money spent here, but money doesn't solve everything. And every one of you live in a community somewhere within Little Rock or wherever you're from that's as small as the area I'm from. We have 15,000 people. So what I'd hope you would do is kind of consider the place you live as its own town, even if it's not, and think about some of the small things you can do when you go back home to change the culture of health in your own area. There's a lot of, a lot of different problems. The schools can fix some of the problems. Elected officials can fix some of the problems. But the people at home can fix most of these problems. They're the ones who have the children. You know, you're, when you go home to your kids, you're the one making the choice of what to put in their mouths, whether to sit them in front of the television or send them outside whether to put them on a school bus or let them walk or bike to school. And there are, there are reasons we can't do some of those things as easily as we, easily as we want to. There are roadblocks everywhere. Uh, the people with the soft drink industry and the fast food industry have a lot more money than we have. And they're in your kid's ear every minute. They're in our ear every minute. We all succumb to it. But we have to start making the small changes ourselves to overcome those things. One of the things we have to concentrate on and, and not disregard is the fact, and I think Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi near me, recently did a study that links obesity to low income. We all intuitively knew that, but now we have a study that says it's true. So at the same time, we're trying to solve the obesity problem, we also have to solve the low income problem. And I don't know quite how to do that. But a couple of the things we've done in our little town, we can only afford one of most things. We have one community center, that's all we could afford to build. But I built it, this community center for the entire town, we built it next to our poorest neighborhood. So everybody drives over there except the poorest people who can walk there. Our farmer's market is, with, is within walking distance of our poorest community. Our community garden is in the middle of the poorest community. The grant we got for Safe Routes to School sidewalks is to the school in our poorest community. 
And, and speaking of that community and the, the Safe Routes to School grant, we had this awful situation they call hazard busing. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it means these kids live close enough to walk. They live three blocks from school. But the conditions are so unsafe, they send a bus to pick them up anyway. That's what we're trying to solve with these sidewalks. Not only will the sidewalks make it physically easier for these kids to walk to school, but there are stats out there that prove that when you put sidewalks in a neighborhood, crime goes down every time. It's kind of like the broken window syndrome. If you fix your broken window, your neighbors are going to, and they'll quit throwing rocks through them. If you put sidewalks out there, people start walking. They start getting out in the neighborhood. There are mature eyes on the neighborhood and on the streets, and it changes the culture. That's what we're talking about, are all these little pieces of how we're going to change the culture of health in our own towns. Policy is a big thing, and we hear about policy all the time. And it seems that that's where everybody's shoving all the money now is policy change. And I believe in that as a piece of what we're doing. Policy is huge. I, I'm a big advocate. The next mayor of Hernando may not be an advocate at all. But if we get the policies in place today, there's a good, good likelihood that they'll stay there even after I'm gone. So that's why that's so important. And some of the policies we've done in Hernando have not been easy. And you have to stand up and fight for them. Uh, we became, and I'm very proud that Arkansas is smoke-free, by the way. I just learned that today. <laughs> Give yourselves a hand for that. It's a big deal. We became smoke-free in my town. Our state is not smoke-free. And we were the fifth city to do it. And it's not easy. You think the entire world is against you. But when you really read the numbers, only 21% of the world's against you. It's not the entire world. So you just, you just you know, steal yourself for it and you go. And you don't realize what's happening while you're fighting this fight. You have all these people coming at you saying, don't do it, you're, you're a communist, you're taking away our rights, all these type things. And all of a sudden, when you get it passed, the people who were quiet, then they come up and thank you. And it's very rewarding at that point. And about 70% of the people in my area were really for this. And they wanted it. And the interesting thing about going smoke free that I found out after the fact are how many of these parents could now take their children with respiratory illnesses out in public. I, I, I knew it was an issue, and especially in the Memphis metropolitan area where we come from, we have the worst respiratory illness rate in the nation just about. And so there are these children that literally couldn't go out to eat. They couldn't go out in public. And so now we're going to talk a little about economics and how that works. We're the only city in our county that's smoke free. So what happens now is all the people in our county who want to be in a smoke-free environment come to my city to eat. So we're getting a lot more sales tax revenue. So that works out. I do hope that the other cities go smoke-free and we level that back out. It'll be worth it. it. Just in our little state, and I don't know if y'all keep the same numbers we do, but 552 people died from secondhand smoke in Mississippi last year. We know what's going on, so we're trying to do our part to solve that. Some of the other policies we have are easier, and I don't know, some towns have them in Arkansas and some don't, but we require sidewalks in any new development and any redevelopment. And that seems so easy, but there are, the majority of cities still don't have that policy. And this is the time to get that policy enacted, and I'll tell you why. The people who fight it are developers. They're all bankrupt right now. Nobody's building anything, so get the policy in while there's nobody to fight you. They shouldn't fight it anyway. It really, you know, it costs about $900 to put a sidewalk in front of an average house. And it increases the value of all the houses in that neighborhood tenfold. It, having a walkable community is so valuable. Not just for aesthetics, not just, not just for your health, but it actually helps knit the entire community together and changes everything. So that's one policy we have. We also mandate that in a plan unit development, you set aside 10% of the land as open space. And I'm going to give you an example of how these policies worked in our town where we don't have any money to buy parkland. I don't think that our city has ever in its history bought parkland, not since 1836 when it was first platted. We've had one gentleman who passed away and gave us 20 acres. Uh, we had a church burned down and give us their site, and we call it Church Park, and it has two tennis courts and a playground on it. We have a vacant lot that a developer left to us that has a little piece of playground equipment. We just never bought any land because we don't have any money to. So this policy worked for us. A gentleman came to us with 200 acres. He wanted to do a plan unit development. Your standard deal with Walmart, the shopping near Walmart, mixed in with homes and, and, and parkland. 
So we made him, with this policy, give us 20 acres of that 200. He had to give it to us. And he was happy to do so. He gave us the wooded spot with the pond on it. He probably couldn't have used it anyway. You know, it was it kind of rolls in places. So all of a sudden, we have 20 acres that would have cost half a million dollars. We don't have half a million dollars, so there it is. And then I said, well, what am I going to do with it? You have to be creative. So we went to Wildlife and Fisheries and applied for a $100,000 grant. And I thought, wow, we can do everything in the world with this. And that's not quite right. But I found out what you could do with $100,000 is put in a quarter mile track, nine parking spots, and a gazebo. But all of a sudden, you have a park. And it's a wonderful place for people to go. And so we got that done, and we had this little park. And then people want more. They always want more. And we always need to give them more. So we went after another wildlife and fisheries grant and got another one for 100000 By this time, we had saved up 50000 of our own to match. So we have 150 now. So we put in another quarter mile of track. And this time, we realized that 10 foot wide is better than 8 foot wide. If you're biking and walking, 10 foot feels better. So the next part's 10 foot wide. We put in, we got a little more sophisticated. We thinking green a little more. So our next parking spots are impervious surface that we can park on so the rainwater sinks in the ground. And the thing I had totally forgotten that you needed a park, we have bathrooms now. So we got all these things done with grant money. This, and, and the other little piece we did to that is it's relationship building. I have the, the phone number to my Walmart manager in my cell phone right now. And he will answer if I call. And he does lots of things for us. Whether you like Walmart or don't, they're there. They're in my town. We made them build the most beautiful Walmart in the whole state, and they're there. And so now that they're there, we're going to become partners with them. And we twisted their arm a little bit and got $25,000 to put in the playground equipment. So now we really have a full park there. And the only capital outlay I have is a $3,000 sign. So I have a park that's worth about $900,000, and we spent $3,000 on it. And we have to come up with annual maintenance. So those are ways you can become creative. There are other things we've done. Um, one thing I was most proud of is when I first became mayor, I noticed that within walking distance of my house, we had an abandoned high school football field. Y'all can all picture one of those. You probably know where one is. And it had the bleachers, had the concession stand, had the bathrooms, and had the old quarter mile walking track. Of course, the rubber's peeling off the track. But the neighbors were sneaking in down there, going through a crack in the fence to walk on that track. And I talked to the superintendent of education, and I said, hey, I can make you look good and make me look good at the same time. And I said, please give this to me. And he looked at me and said, are you stupid? Are you crazy? I said, no, I just want it. He said, OK, great. Now I don't have to mow it anymore. So we had our lawyers do the paperwork. And next thing you know, we own this football field and track. We, all of a sudden, I have it, and I don't know what to do with it. I didn't have a parks department at that point. I'd just taken office. We did not have a parks department at all five years ago. So my assistant, who I had just hired, I told her she was in charge of the park now. <laughs> so she went down there every day and sat down there and watched volunteers paint the bathroom and fix it and pressure wash the bleachers and all these things. And seven weeks after we took office, we had 700 kids playing youth football there. They never had a place to play before. They were just basically playing in sand lots. So it's just another way. And this was a win-win. The Board of Education was happy to unload that thing. It was costing them money. We needed it, and it's a, it's a wonderful park now. We've invested money in it since then. We've had to put up two new light posts, and that may not sound like much, but that's $14,000, and that's a lot of money in our little town, but you scrape and scrounge and do these things. And we've added some workout equipment at the end of the field, the outdoor fitness equipment, and so then we changed the name of the park to the Hernando Sports and Fitness Park. But until I'm dead, people will still call it the old football field. That's just the way that works. But it's another place that our kids can have to play. And I'll, I'll give you one last example of that, and this one's the most funny, and I have to make fun of myself on this one. I got a call one day from a lady, and she said, there's this vacant lot at the end of my street, and the grass is this tall. Will you do something about it? And I said, well, of course I will. I'll find out who owns it, and we'll make them cut the grass. So I went down and looked at it. I always go look at everything so the constituents can see me out there looking and know I care. <laughs> and I was there doing my thing. And I went back to my planning director and I said, Bob, who owns this lot? He said, I don't know. I'll check on it. And he called me back about an hour later. I said, what took so long? He said, well, I figured out who owns the lot. I said, who is it? He said, it's the city of Hernando. <laughs> so we had this lot we didn't even know we owned. And literally, I would say, I don't know, it may be like from this pillar to this pillar, this long. That's all it is. It's a little spot. 
So immediately we mowed the grass. I could do that then. But we had built this wonderful, this wonderful big playground at one of our other parks with community help. It was another community involvement process. And we had the old playground equipment sitting there. It was just, it was almost sad. It was sitting off in a corner. Nobody was using it because we had the new stuff. But this was a poor neighborhood where this vacant lot was. So we paid professionals to pick that old playground equipment up and move it, refurbish it, make sure it was safe. And so all of a sudden now for $4,000, I have another park. And it's in an area where there are children who couldn't get to the other side of town. They couldn't walk over there. Now they literally walk out their door and go half a block and they've got a small piece of playground equipment. It's not huge, it's not beautiful, but it's just another way the kids can get outside and play on limited funds. I'll give you another example of things we've done. And the reason I'm giving you all these examples, I just want you to get your mind working in that direction. It doesn't take money. I hope you can go home and find some small thing similar to this that you can just take on as your own project, a win-win that'll help everybody. But we had the Girl Scouts come to us and they do something called a gold project, which for you gentlemen, it's the same as an eagle project for Boy Scouts. And they said, what can we do? And I never have the good ideas, but I have good staff who have good ideas. So Shelly tells me that they should map and do an inventory of our old, old downtown sidewalks. So she drew this little line on the map, gave it to the Girl Scouts and said, inventory our old sidewalks. And I'm sure all y'all can picture what old sidewalks in an old town look like. Some places you're walking and they just disappear because grass has grown over them. Other places you walk and it's like a skateboard ramp because the tree roots humped it up. And they're just crumbling, they're in terrible shape in general. They're still that way in front of my house. I have to be the last one in town to get new sidewalks. Y'all can imagine why that would be. But so we gave them the map and we gave them the phone number to the county GIS guy. And they came back two months later and they wanted to do a presentation in my office. They had music behind their presentation. They flashed this thing up on the wall. They had, they had all this wonderful stuff going on and they would click on something and all of a sudden this picture of my sidewalk would show up and it was embarrassing because it would be a terrible sidewalk. It was crumbling and they had ranked them from A to D and I got to thinking, I said, this is a great presentation. So I put them on the agenda to show it to my board of aldermen. And y'all can imagine what happened in this public meeting. The board of aldermen are slapping them on the back and telling them how wonderful they are and how proud they are. And so then they sent them on their way. And the next item on the agenda said, approve $50,000 for sidewalk repairs. So how do you think they voted? So we got 50,000 bucks to fix sidewalks. Now that we actually had a little money and that's not a lot of money. And I hope I don't offend anyone here. I hope there's no engineers or architects but if you're replacing existing sidewalks, you don't really need to spend a lot of money on engineers and architects. You can have your parks department or you can have your public works guys hire a concrete crew and do it. And that's what we did. We literally did it 100 feet at a time. We just took up the old sidewalk, made sure the slope was right, and laid new sidewalks. And you wouldn't believe how many sidewalks we got in place for $50,000. And that's in addition, and I told you all about our policy that we put in place in 01 of requiring sidewalks with new development. We, it just so happened that was right before we became the fastest growing county in the United States. So my best estimate is we have about 22 new linear miles of sidewalks that have been laid in our city without tax dollars, just due to that policy. So once again, I tell you, this is the time to get that policy in place while nothing's being built. Because the economy will come back, it may never come back like it was, but things will be built again. And you need to put sidewalks and bike lanes in when this happens. The other way you can do things on the cheap, and I have, to, I have to give a little background on this. When I first took office, I'm part of the design and review team. So if something new is coming in or a new subdivision, I'm in on the first meeting, the, the big planning meeting. And my fire chief kept saying, well, this road needs to be 50 feet wide. And I would say, why? And he said, well, the fire truck may need to do a U-turn. And I said, why? And he said, well, if they pass the house or whatever. And I said, how often does that happen? Are firemen not that smart? And he said, no, they are. I said, then let's not make 50 foot wide streets anymore. And so we quit doing that. And guess what? It's been five years and we haven't had to do a U-turn in a fire truck yet. But you have to think rationally sometimes and make sure the right people are making those decisions. The planner knew we shouldn't have 50 foot wide streets in the middle of the neighborhood. But having said all that, from old policy, we have 55, 50 foot wide streets through our neighborhoods. And people call me and say cars are speeding here all the time and it's unsafe 
and they're right. People speed, the wider street is, the faster we're gonna drive. I'll do it, you'll do it, it just happens. The interesting thing is you can go to those streets and buy some paint and measure in six feet from that side and six feet from that side and then buy yourself a template and spray paint bike symbols and you have bike lanes on the street. That's simple. It's not free, it's not really that cheap, but it's fairly inexpensive. And you have bike lanes, not only now do you have a way for people to cycle on your streets, but visually it narrows those streets and the traffic slows down. And we, we are able to test that. We have one of those traffic trailers that tells you how fast you're going, and we set them up before and after, and the speeds have decreased since we put those in. So those are some small things that will work. One other thing I want to talk about is the economics of this, and I think Anna alluded to it. In, in just in my state, one of the smallest states in the nation, we, have, we are spending $989 million a year, and that was two years ago, on obesity-related illnesses. That's a billion dollars. It's that's a lot of money in our state. And they're telling me in six years that's going to be three billion, which means our state will go bankrupt. We don't have another two billion, we just don't. They're cutting everything out of the budget right now. The really interesting part of that was about 580 million of that is Medicare and Medicaid. We know those are our tax dollars. The other 400 million, I got to ask him where that came from, and, and we have a, the Stennis Institute of Government, it's a kind of a policy center at Mississippi State University. They did a study for us. That other 400 million is being paid in higher insurance premiums by businesses, by the employers in our state. We're always talking about creating more jobs. How many more jobs could these employers create if they had that extra $400 million? So this is gonna help us with every, not just health. The health part we do because we know it's the right thing to do. Some people we can't convince it's the right thing to do unless we can tie dollars to it. That's why I like to talk about the dollars. It's very important. Uh, the, the national numbers, the numbers we had seen a year ago were 142 billion. I just saw something a couple of days ago that said, well, it may be closer to 160 billion on obesity related illnesses. Either way, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money being wasted. But the big thing we're wasting are our lives and our children's lives. If we're not living to our fullest capacity, if we're not letting our children grow to their fullest capacity, we're not doing the right thing. And one of the last things I want to talk about is why we should be doing this as elected officials. So I have to speak from my perspective now. People say, why are you involved in this? We have a charge, I think, and it's not always in every oath we take, but in some of them it is, that we're to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. I think that's what we're doing by doing these type things. The one thing we have to be very careful of is that we don't tell people that they have to be healthy. That's a personal decision. It is, even though it affects our pocketbooks, that's still a personal decision that they have to be healthy if they're not affecting your health by blowing smoke in your face. But that's their decision if they want to be unhealthy. But I firmly believe I've taken that decision out of their hands if I don't give them an opportunity and an atmosphere for good health. So that's where I think that we fit in as elected officials or as people in the health industry or as people in the education industry. We have to put those things in place for our people. Um, I want to just touch on one more tiny little thing, and, and all this takes work. Every bit of it takes work. It's not easy. If you just think you're going to go out there and make a proclamation and it happens, it's not. Our, and you just, the first lady, when I got to be with her that day, it was the most incredible thing I've ever done when I got to go to the White House and speak with her. But one thing I noticed that morning in the newspaper, she had said, let's quit talking and just get moving. Let's do something. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. There are many things we've done in our town that still aren't perfect. The programming isn't perfect, everything's not jiving just right, but we're doing stuff. And it's creating what I like to call a culture of health in Hernando. There are literally people moving to Hernando, Mississippi because they think we're healthier than everybody else in the state. And we may be because Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of Mississippi just said we were. We're very proud of that. But that was more not saying that we're statistically healthier, but that we're doing more heading that direction. So I want to get statistically the healthiest. Our county is, but I want our city to be at some point. But one thing we didn't have when I took office five years ago, and when we're talking about work, we didn't have a parks department. I alluded to that earlier. Nothing. We had some, some public works guys that mowed the grass in the parks when it got too high. Now we have a parks director, an assistant director, a receptionist that handles all the ball sign-ups and the senior citizens. We have three groundskeepers because I'm very, I feel very firmly that things have to look nice and feel safe for people to use them. That is, 
you can't overstress the importance of that. People don't want to be in a place that doesn't feel safe. And if it's clean, it feels safe. It's that simple. So we focus on that a lot. But we not, not just to toot our horn and say we have a parks department now, the reason I can say that is we now have seniors arthritis exercise, we have seniors groups, we have fall soccer and spring soccer for youth. We have adult tennis, youth tennis, youth basketball, adult basketball. None of those things existed in our town five years ago. Can you imagine how many thousands of kids in those five years have been able to do something healthy? And that's what's rewarding about my job. We get to do those things. And the one, one other thing we did, and I'll, I'll end on this note and then I'll take questions. You, you don't wait till everything's perfect. You do it just when you can get there and do a little bit. We started our farmer's market in August, which is a crazy time to start a farmer's market. We did that two and a half years ago. Everybody said, no, wait till next year. You gotta start in May. And I said, I'm tired of putting it off. Let's just start. And we did. And in that short two month time frame, we ended up with, I think 19 vendors, which was pretty good for our little town. And then we took all winter and held meetings and literally these people grew more crops in the spring getting ready for the next market. And so we had one more full season. Now we've got another full season. And, and speaking of your low income people, we're, we're giving vouchers to our low income seniors through a USDA program to spend at the farmer's market. It's only $2,000, but when you divide that amongst 20, 20 people, that's a lot of vegetables they're getting that they wouldn't have gotten. So we now, because we went ahead and started, two and a half years later, we have what's been called the favorite farmer's market in the state of Mississippi. We have 39 vendors and almost 1,000 people come through every Saturday morning. That's the good thing to do. That's the right thing to do. If we have to put numbers with it, this thing has turned into a business incubator. It's on our square. The ladies that own the dress shop and the gift shop across the street now open their stores earlier because we're drawing customers to the square that used to not come. They're making more money. Uh, Juan Pablo Arancibia sold bread there for three weeks. It cost you $10 to set up. So he did a $30 market study and decided he had enough customers to open a French bakery on our square that will open next week. One of the other guys is a real estate guy. We all talked about earlier what's going on with those guys. Everybody's hurting in the real estate market. He took his real estate office and has turned it into a country store where he grows fresh vegetables at his home and sells them there on our square. So there are two businesses that have come out of our farmer's market this year. And that's, that may not sound like much, but it's huge. To have two new businesses on my little tiny square is a big deal for Hernando. And that can just be exponential when we all leave here and go home and do the same things. So having said all that, the one thing I want to leave you with is all of our job, not just my job, all of our job is to try to create a culture of good health and give everyone an atmosphere and an opportunity for good health. And thank you. All right, let's uh, we have any questions here. Kim, I'll wait for the mic, please. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Kim Caldwell. I'm a student here at the Clinton School, and I'm really excited to hear about all these projects, and you've referenced uh, relationships and working with others. And I wonder if you can speak to any nonprofit or community-based organization partnerships that have helped you be able to make these incredible results. I can. Actually, I think I'll have to start and give maybe a long-winded answer to how I got where I am today. We have something called the Northwest Mississippi Community Foundation. And what they, they took on obe childhood obesity as an initiative about nine years ago for some crazy reason. And they were the first in our state, really. They looked around and saw it wasn't being done. But as part of that, they formed a regional health council and about three years ago, and they asked me to be on it. I was the token elected official. And I said, sure, I'll be on it. And I went to the first meeting. I did not know about the obesity epidemic. I knew nothing about it. And there were doctors, the head of the state health guy was there, educators, people like that. While I was in that meeting, I spoke up about a couple of issues. And a lady named Ellen Jones was on the planning committee for the Southern Obesity Conference. And she invited me to come be a speaker. And I'd never spoken outside of my town. I'd never spoken on this topic. So I just went and talked about my parks and some of the things we were doing. But that's where I learned about the obesity epidemic. But bigger than that, they stuck us off in a room with everybody from Mississippi. So I met all these people from Mississippi that I had never met. And there were people from Arkansas in another room. And I hope the same thing happened there. But mostly I met these people from the state health department. And I didn't know they were there and they didn't know I was here. And they've, 
we finally figured out they were watching me and they saw that I was the one that got to be behind the podium just by virtue of my job. That's what I get to do. They have all the knowledge and the science. I have the podium. So we need a partnership there. And we formed that partnership with the state health department. Uh, we're also still working with the Community Foundation Northwest Mississippi. They got a Healthy Kids Healthy Community Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant, and we're encompassed in that. So we're working with that partnership. I'm also doing a partnership through the National League of Cities that Anna talked about. Uh, we have a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant, and I'm co-chair of that with the mayor of Savannah and the mayor of Baton Rouge, and our goal there is to train other elected officials to do these things in their town. So did that answer? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Wait, wait, hold on, Kenny's going to get right behind. What, what you've done in Hernando has achieved a lot of acclaim both regionally and nationally. Could you expand a bit, and you talked about this somewhat, on the impact it's had on the citizens of Hernando, their attitude about the city they live in, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that uh, so you've attracted some new residents uh, can you be more specific on that? And I have will. You, have you attracted uh, uh, business and industry uh, to Hernando, and, and both in terms of things you can measure and, and maybe just that you kind of feel? Okay. And he's talking about recruiting people to town and business and industry. When I first took office, we're, we're literally a bedroom community of Memphis. We don't have much industry. We're 14 miles south, so most of our people go work in Memphis. So we want to recruit industry. But more than that, we really, most of our workers would be considered white collar workers. So we want to recruit corporate headquarters. So I went to my economic developer for the county, said, how do we do that? He said, one of the main things you need is a pedestrian friendly, walkable community, bikeable community, because the people who work in those jobs want to live in that atmosphere. What we've literally seen in the state of Mississippi are CEOs come to town, they'll pick a town in Mississippi, look at it, say, this looks good to locate in. They always go home, and then they, the team of them bring their spouses back. And their spouses look around and say, I'm not living here. And, and, and literally, you lose your industry. That's, it really works that way. So we know that this is part of our recruiting, and we are, we're not at the point. We, our demographics are not our demographics, but our population isn't quite there. But we have quite a few on the hook now that we wouldn't have had on the hook before. So from an industry standpoint, that's where we are. The other thing. As far as residents, we don't have any money to do an official study, but I go to the farmer's market every Saturday. And so, of course, the neighbors, everybody's up there. I know a lot of the people. And they all say, let me introduce you to my new neighbor. And the first question I always ask that new neighbor, being a mayor, I want to know, why did you move to Hernando? And it is amazing how many of those people say, we got a, our job transferred us to Memphis. We got an apartment for six months. We knew we wanted to live in DeSoto County, Mississippi. And we picked Hernando specifically because y'all are the healthy city. I hear that time and time again. And I specifically hear about the, the smoking ban. That's one of the huge reasons people move to our town. But the farmer's market is a big deal. It just, y'all know how, if y'all can just picture a farmer's market set up around an old courthouse in the middle of town, that's what we have. It just feels incredible. That's why I hang out there for four hours every Saturday. You just, you know, the kids are kicking the soccer ball on the lawn and people are climbing trees and, it just, it just feels like Americana. And people are, people are looking for that experience. And we, the health part of that is one way to give it to them. The other thing I've noticed, nobody cycled when I moved to that town in 97, nobody. Now we have an active cycling club of over 40 people. You'll see them riding in big packs all the time. I have six police officers on bicycles. They're leading groups, doing trainings. Uh, we have people they're just people walking and biking everywhere now. You didn't, you just, even though I don't have a study, I didn't see that 13 years ago. And it just seems like as more people do it, it's just exponential. People just start taking the, taking the hint and doing the same thing. Mayor, that uh, idea of a study sounds like a good Clinton School project to me. We, you and I just may need to talk about a proposal that I we like can that. make come over and help you. That'd be a nice thing to do. Anna, here comes Nick. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk really briefly about, um, number one, any work that you've done with schools, within the schools, for kids there in Hernando, and number two, your thoughts on health care reform and it's um, how it will address obesity. Okay. Uh, I'll take the first one. I'll take both of them. I'll take the first one first. The, the schools in our district, we now have the largest school district in the state with 32,000 students. It's a county school district. 
I don't have anything to do with it, except for the fact that they know I'm a cheerleader, and I've talked to a lot of their people over the years, and we encourage them, we help them, we partner with them, we do joint use with them. We don't have a gym, so our basketball leagues are running the high school gym. So we have that good partnership. The, our school system, though, are, they're doing great things. Uh, eight, we have 40 schools now, not in our city, but in our entire county in that school system. Eight or nine of them have the combi ovens in them now, and I think all the new ones are being built with combi ovens. If y'all are familiar with that, it's where you, you literally take the deep fat fryer out of the school and throw it away, and they put this combination oven in. I'm not real sure of the technology, but it bakes things and makes them taste fried. That's, that's the best way I can describe it. So you just throw the fryer out and you get the combi ovens. Uh, they've gotten all the, the sugar-sweetened snacks out of the vending machine. Sugar-sweetened beverages are gone. The piece they're not at, they're still selling them as fundraisers. They're still selling them at football games. We haven't, we haven't gotten that far yet, but those, that's how far we have gotten. As far as the obesity and the health care reform, believe it or not, of all people, I'm not that in tune with the health care reform bill. But I am very in tune with the piece of it about menu labeling because I've been pushing for menu labeling. I actually wrote that into a CPPW grant, and I'm trying to convince my new Zaxby's to do menu labeling right now. But I am tickled to death that menu labeling is part of that. And I think that's, that's a big step. I, I still think that information to the people is the best thing we can do to solve this problem. And that's, that's a huge piece of it. People don't know to go ask for the sheet of paper to see how many calories they're getting. But if it's up there on the board, they'll see it. And it, I think it'll change. Good afternoon. My name is Katherine Donald, and I work for a nonprofit organization, uh, Coalition for Tobacco Free Arkansas. And my question to you is, if you had the potential and the power to gather elected officials, let's just say in the city of Little Rock, and to encourage them to promote a smoke-free parks policy that was recently passed by our parks department uh, last October. This is true. But as you look around our parks, there's nowhere where signage is noted to indicate to the public that Little Rock endorses, promotes smoke-free environments by way of our city parks. So if you were a cheerleader and you could pat them on the back and encourage them to do the right thing, what would be the message you would send, or what would you say to our elected officials to encourage them to promote your smoke-free parks, encourage your parks department to also adopt a smoke-free policy for your zoo? What would you do? I have a feeling that there's always that, and, and I addressed it a little bit earlier, about how elected officials feel like they might possibly lose votes by endorsing the smoke-free, and you will lose some votes. You, you just are going to. Every decision you make is going to lose you a vote somewhere if you're doing something. I guess the easiest way to, to say that from my perspective is with the smoke free. And when I proposed that in my little town of Hernando, Mississippi, and at that point there were only four smoke free towns in the entire state. That was four years ago. My own family told me I'd never get reelected. But I felt strongly enough about it. And I thought, you know what, I may not. They may be right. But if I can get this done, it's worth getting kicked out. But that didn't happen. I got elected the first time with 52 or 53 percent. You know, that's what happens to first time people. Nobody really knows you. You're just out there fighting. But most of what I've been doing, you know, I've, I, you've got to balance budgets and do all that stuff. They expect you to have a good fire department, a good police department, balance the budget. The health stuff is like the land yap. It's the extra stuff. And that and the smoking ban, I think the people really liked it. And I can prove that, I think, because they re-elected me a year ago with 65.3%. So that's what I would say to an elected official. The people want it. The people, the people are literally dying to have it. And, the, and they, will, they will vote you back in office if you do it. 